Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the gospel according to John, from the 14th chapter, beginning with the 15th verse, verses 15 through 21. Listen for the word of the Lord. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father. And I will love them and reveal myself to them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of the principal tenets of our Christian faith is that Jesus loves us. It's etched into our brains at a very young age. The first song I remember learning, and probably one of the first songs that you learned, was Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones for him belong. They are weak, but we are strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so. And indeed, the Bible informs us that Jesus does love us. God loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves me. We will see that love explicitly demonstrated in our scripture lessons this morning. And if your parents took you to Sunday school and church, you were surely influenced by other songs and hymns of Christ's love. The pastor I was most influenced by as a young adult prefaced his morning prayer with the first verse of, What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Not once does the word love appear in any of the three verses of that hymn. But you might want to ask yourself, why is, why is it that God incarnate in Jesus Christ listens to our prayers and bears our sins and griefs? The answer is very simple. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. There's perhaps no place in the Bible where we are more capable of feeling Christ's love with any greater intensity than in the Gospel of John and especially within the context of our gospel lesson this morning, where Jesus is preparing his disciples for his eventual departure. Jesus has good reason for being concerned. The disciples have been with Jesus for three years, listening to his teaching, watching him heal the blind, cure the lame, and cast out demons. They were recently present when he raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. The disciples ate with Jesus, traveled with Jesus, and now have followed him for the third time to Jerusalem. Jesus had become more than just a teacher to them. He had become their friend, their confidant, their source of hope and dreams for the future. What are they going to think when he tells them he's bailing on them? Jesus doesn't want his disciples to be discouraged or distraught or afraid because of his absence. Instead, he wants to instill hope and purpose and confidence into their lives to the point where they can carry on Jesus' ministry after he leaves. John devotes five chapters to this preparation and what we refer to as Jesus' final discourse. This final discourse begins in a room in which he has gathered his, four, his 12 disciples for a meal, followed by a rather lengthy dissertation. The day is Thursday of that first Holy Week. In just a matter of hours, he will be arrested tried, and nailed to a cross. As a sign of his love for his disciples, he withdraws from the supper table, ties a towel around his waist, and begins washing the disciples' feet. One of his disciples, Peter, is reluctant to have his feet washed. He feels it's below the dignity of a teacher to stoop to the level of a servant in order to perform this menial task of hospitality. Peter misses the point. Becoming a servant is exactly what Jesus wants to portray. Jesus is the teacher, 
And he is teaching the disciples what it means and how it feels to be loved. And then he explains to his disciples that what they had just witnessed was an example. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. From Jesus' perspective, it's not enough that the disciples receive Jesus' love. They need to love others as well. In fact, he articulates this concept to his disciples in the form of a new commandment. I give you a new commandment, he told his disciples, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. It's important to remember that in John's gospel, Jesus' commandment, or sometimes John expresses this in the plural as commandments, are all about loving others. Which brings us to our gospel reading this morning. Jesus brackets our scripture lesson this morning with two statements emphasizing obedience. In the first one, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And at the conclusion of our scripture lesson this, uh, this morning, he essentially says, says the same thing. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. Sandwiched in between these two statements is a promise from Jesus to his disciples that if they love him and keep his commandments, he will pray to the Father and the Father will give you another advocate to be with you forever. The fact that Jesus will always be with us is an important affirmation, maybe one of the most important affirmations that we as Christians can believe. Jesus promises his disciples that he would not leave them orphaned. The word orphaned is a word that implies total abandonment by parents and guardians, whether by death or any other reason. It's a word that signifies that we are alone and on our own without benefit of another person's wisdom and resources. But Jesus promises that that would never, ever happen to those who trust and obey him. Some of you may recall that in the 1992 Summer Olympics held in Barcelona, Spain, a young British runner by the name of Derek Redman competed in the 400-meter race. He had trained his entire life for this race and had distinguished himself by breaking his country's record at age 19. He led throughout most of the race and past the halfway mark, he was virtually a shoe-in to win the race. But with 175 meters to go, he hears a pop and feels the pain of an injured right hamstring muscle. Anyone, including myself, who has ever experienced the pain of a hamstring injury knows the excruciating pain this type of injury causes. He tries to hop on one foot, but falls to the ground. Medical personnel come to pick him up on a stretcher, but he won't have anything to do with them. He didn't train his entire life or come this far not to complete the race. Meanwhile, his father, Jim, is up in the top of the stands. Seeing his son in trouble, he begins racing down from the top row. He pushes towards the track, sidestepping some people and bumping into others. He has no right or credential or permission to be on the track, but all he can think about is getting to his son to help him up. He is absolutely single-minded about this and isn't going to be stopped by anyone. Finally, he reaches his son, grabs hold of him and says, I'm here, son. We'll finish this race together. And with 65,000 fans cheering him on, they hobble towards the finish line. A few yards before the finish line, his father releases his son so he can cross the finish line by himself and complete the race. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit stands in for us and helps us complete the race. The Holy Spirit doesn't leave us abandoned or orphaned, but sticks with us throughout this lifetime and into the next. Jesus told his disciples that he will not leave them orphaned. I am coming to you, he says, and his coming is in the form of the Holy Spirit, or here called in the Greek, the paraclete, or the advocate. Some translations refer to the Holy Spirit as comforter, helper, counselor, and indeed the Holy Spirit is all of these things. Jesus told his disciples that even after his death, he would still be with them. He will still encourage them, plead with them, pray for them, teach them, and comfort them. 
but the nature of his presence will change. In a little while, he told his disciples, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. He will be present to them in the form of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. The disciples will not have to run their race alone, and they will not have to cross the finish line alone, and neither will we. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of life. Because I live, promises Jesus to his followers, you will live also. The good news is that Jesus has conquered the power of sin and death, and the same God who raised Jesus from the dead will give life to our bodies through his spirit that dwells in us. No matter what tragedies come our way, whether they are academic or medical or vocational or emotional or virus-related, we can hold tight to the promise that Jesus gives us the gift of life, abundant life in the world today and life eternal in the world to come. Of course, there are strings, strings attached. Jesus talks about obedience. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's important to note that Jesus isn't saying, if you want my love, you have to keep my commandments. What he is saying is that by keeping Jesus' commandments, you show your love and faith in Jesus. You can't earn Jesus' love, but you can surely demonstrate it. Just as important, if you love Jesus, you're going to want to obey Jesus. And in John's gospel, keeping Jesus' commandments isn't that hard to remember. The important thing to keep in mind is that the commandments of Jesus all involve living a life of love. Remember, just a few verses earlier, Jesus told his disciples, I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. In our first lesson this morning, the disciple Peter, writing to the churches in Asia Minor who are suffering because of their newfound faith, he explains this. Even in times of suffering, it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. In Jesus Christ, God has given us the perfect example of perfect love for others. So why did Jesus suffer and die for us? Why did Jesus not leave his disciples orphaned, but came to them in the form of the Holy Spirit? The answer is very simple. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Thanks be to God. Amen.